I'll never forget in Bible college when I went to their chapel, like in each of the dorms, and I believe on each level, there was like, I think two or three levels in the dorm. The, at the end of each level, there was a chapel that they had built. On the other end was like a study area that people can go to study. And so I recall one night, you know, just going into the chapel and, you know, I was just talking to God. I was like, Lord, I want to love like you love. And I mean, when we pray certain things, we really don't think about how God is going to bring about what we're praying for. We can get so lost up in the moment of our prayer, you know, and God sees the heart, but you know, he's going to test our very words that, you know, okay, you really want this? Well, in order for me to bring you this, I got to form this in you. And so you want to be more loving? Well, he's going to give you unloving people to deal with. You know, you, you want to be merciful? Well, you're going to deal with a lot of people that need mercy. And that may go against, you know, the grain of what you learned in this world. You know, when it comes to financial mercy, there's a lot of people out there that really don't have it. You know, they, I'm not saying in the sense, I'm not saying that financially they don't, they don't have it. I'm saying in their heart, they don't have that mercy to help somebody else out. Or it could be mercy in other areas. Because, you know, financially, they've learned to be successful in this world, so it goes you know, to be merciful, you know, means that you're going to go against exactly what, you know, the, this financial garbage dictates. So, you know, God, like I said, takes our prayer seriously. You know, just to give another example, I, I remember, you know, going to my church building. And I don't know if any of you heard of IHOP. Not the pancake place, but the International House of Prayer. You know, people go on there. I think you can go ihop.org, maybe. And it's in Kansas. And it is a, you know, it's a live thing where people are worshiping constantly. There's different sessions. You know, worshipers change. Other ones come in and do their thing. And it's all for the purpose of, you know, worshiping God 24 seven. So, you know, where I lived at my church, there were a few people that got together to create something similar to that, where they would have, you know, different sessions that would come in where people would worship. And so, you know, people would come worship. So I just, I remember the, the, the worship leader and she was praying to God at, at the piano. She's like, Lord, I want to love like you love. Send, send the lost in Lord, stuff like that. Like I say, you get caught up in your prayer and in the moment, not thinking about what's going to happen. So it could have been a couple of sessions later that this drunk man comes in and apparently he's enjoying what he's hearing. And so he involves himself in the worship. So he's playing on, you know, the bongo drums. And the people that were up there worshiping were offended. You know, that he was drunk and that he was doing that. I don't know if they thought that he was mocking God or anything like that. But, you know, that wasn't the case at all. Because at the close of the session, this man talks to my friend. He said, I had a revelation. My friend was like, what? He said, of love. And so, honestly, I think it was an angel that was testing the heart of people. So, you want to love? Okay, well, I'm going to send you somebody that's going to grind against your flesh. You know, what are you going to do in the moment? So, the worship leader that had prayed, Lord, send in the lost. I want to love like you love. Well, she came to you know, a few people in there and she was just expressing how offended she was that this man was in there. 
and somebody said to her, they said, isn't this what you prayed for one session? And she really didn't have anything to say to that. But that was the whole point is that, you know, God can bring up certain situations in our lives that, you know, grind against our flesh. And he's asking, are you really going to love like I love? And, you know, for me personally, I've put videos out there of my own struggle and loving, you know, having a, a stepkid that, from what I see, from my own point of view, that they could care less. And, you know, I, I said recently about how she said to her mom that all I care about is my son the second oldest, and she's last. And I'm like thinking to myself, that is a bunch of BS, man. Because whatever she asked me to do, I would do. I would be compliant with everything she wanted. You know, and you heard me personally in the past, other videos, that I would do anything for them. You know, if they asked me, and you know, maybe I have a expectation tied to it that maybe I, you know, a relationship would blossom out of me doing this stuff. But as far as I see, nothing come from that. So, you know, was the oldest trying to turn her mom against me, trying to split us? Or was she speaking from the heart? That's, you know, that she wants to be priority from the heart. She wants something more than a relationship. You know, wants a relationship with me. But everything I've seen out of her, you know, says you know, the complete difference. You know, th there was nothing in her that showed me that she actually wanted, you know, a relationship. You know, and I have, believe me, I have tried all through the years to try to be a good stepdad. I'm saying stepdad because apparently that's all I am to them. You know, when things are good, maybe I'm dad. When things are bad, I'm Rob. When things are semi-bad, I'm stepdad. So, you know, I... It's the hardest thing to take the initiative and love somebody that from your perspective, doesn't care, you know, and, you know, perhaps I'm speaking out of rejection, which is probably what's going on, but, you know, it is the hardest thing, like, a lot of people are dealing with issues in their lives, and when it's hard for them, what if somebody is sexually abused? Well, God wants them to forgive their abuser. That's a hard thing to do. And you're angry, especially angry, if the abuser doesn't admit to their wrong. You know, but the the, the forgiveness doesn't hinge on that. you got to forgive regardless. And that is the hardest thing for a lot of people to do. To, you know, love your enemy. And that's another thing. Somebody slaps you across your face. It's hard to forgive that. You know, being put in that place where you're constantly taken advantage of, where you're constantly mistreated, to take the initiative and love somebody. And so, recently, I've had, you know, a, a few nights, I've had this dream, and I, I assume it's from God, and each of the dreams... It seemed like I worked things out with the oldest. And it felt like a, a breath of fresh air. You know, things were finally dealt with until I woke up and realized it was just a dream and it wasn't real. And I'm like, oh, man. So I think, honestly, God wants me to reach out to her, which is so hard. Because... That's all I've been doing. I always do that. 
I always reach out to her. I always take the initiative when she doesn't take the initiative. But what can I expect? You know, I pray to God, Lord, I want to love like you love. Well, he's sending me people that are hard to love. You know, being in a marriage to where you're not fulfilled, you're not receiving the love from your spouse like you want. And honestly, I think I've gotten to the point, and I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing, I've gotten to the point to where I don't even look at that anymore. You know, I take every day as it is. Okay, my wife's not hugging me. My wife doesn't kiss me unless she's at work and other people are around. Or she won't show any kind of affection unless family's around. So I, I've taken it as, okay, well, I, this is the way life is. This is the way a marriage is. And so I just got to deal with it. I'm going to keep trying to serve, remembering to do it for Jesus, even when I'm taken for granted, you know, and I've gotten to the point to where, yeah, I'm like, okay, this is, this is life. This is the way I'm, this is the way my marriage is, you know, and I'm not saying that my wife and I don't get along. We get along great. I mean, we joke. We laugh, we watch movies together. She's in one seat, I'm in another. <coughs> but there's no intimacy. I don't know, it's been months since there had been any intimacy. So I've, I don't know, I guess the word would be complacent for the marriage. It doesn't mean that I stop serving, I still serve. But I just want to remember to try to be there for her when she needs an ear and try to encourage her, you know, speak life into her because that's what her love language is, is words of affirmation. So, you know, even if I'm not fulfilled, you know, God get me to that place to where I don't even look at that anymore. Maybe I'm there. I don't know. But. You know, I just, like I said, he sends you people that are unloving, if that is your prayer. And so since God has given me those two dreams, where things, I work things out with the oldest, you know, I, I felt refreshed, but when waking up, finding out it's not, it was only a dream, meaning that I still have to go through whatever potentially rejecting circumstance, you know, and I feel like I can't talk to her. So uh, I'm thinking, honestly, maybe I can write her a letter if she can read my writing and stick it up on her stair. And I feel like that's my way of trying to do my part because I feel like I can't, I can't go up in her room and talk to her because it feels awkward. And, you know, from my perspective, she doesn't talk to me unless she wants something. And you've heard that plenty of times before. She'll come down. She'll talk to her mom. She stands in front of her mom to where I can't see my wife. And with somebody that mistreats you like that, it's hard to take the initiative to love. But if I want to love like Jesus loves, and I want to be a pioneer in this fact, then this is something that I have to do. You know, I'm writing this book, Love One Another. Well, I need to live the, the talk. So, you know, I'm asking God, you know, when a good time is to do this, you know, and it feels like it's pulling teeth it's the hardest thing to do because I wrote letters to her in the past when my wife and I were separated. She was angry. I don't know why she was angry. You would think that she would be happy. So maybe she was angry that I wasn't there 
I don't know if she took it personally. I don't know if she thought that it was her fault, which partially, I mean, it, circumstances and how she acted it and didn't help. It, it brought separation between my wife and I. And it wasn't just her, it was the second oldest as well. And it wasn't just them, it was the circumstances between my wife and I that built up. But the stuff going on around the house didn't help things. So, no, it wasn't all, all on them. But... I wrote her a letter in the past, out, you know, when my wife and I were separated, of saying it's not your fault. All this is just things between, it's things that I'm dealing with, which was true. You know, no one else is dealing with it, I'm dealing with it. And so, I don't know, I, I felt honestly that there was nothing I could say to her. You know, I could have argued very well my position. You know, whenever she gave me a hard time, like what she did in the car where we were going to go see the shack, she didn't want me. She didn't want me there. And so I respected that. And I could have easily said, what are you talking about? You know, I could have argued with her, but it wouldn't have gone anywhere. You know, so I just took it. I took the, the lash and I was... That's all I seem to take with her is lashes, you know, and then for her to say recently that all, all that matters to me is my son, the second oldest, the oldest in her. Tell me exactly how that is. You know, that's my first question. How, how is that when I'm taking you everywhere you want to go? And then the second would be like, what do you want me to do? What do you want of me? You know, because why are you saying this? You know, what is your reason for saying this? What is your intention? Is it to bring separation between me and my wife? Or are you speaking from the heart that you honestly want a relationship with me? Well, if you want a relationship with me, then it takes two as well. It takes two to make things work. Like a marriage, you know, you can't expect one spouse to do everything, you know, trying to make the marriage work without the other partner helping out, which a lot of times it seems like that's the way things are, but it takes two. You, you know, you may not feel comfortable expressing your feelings, but if you truly care about somebody then you're going to take the initiative and do that. She, she don't express her feelings, but she may have to do that. Maybe she does that with her boyfriend, but if you truly want a real relationship with me, then you have to take that step and express that. I'm not a mind reader. I don't know what's going on in her mind. I don't know what's going on in her heart. So it has to be me that has to take the initiative and write her a letter. Putting it out there that, hey, if you ever need to talk, I'm here. Let's work on any issues. I just... It's the hardest. So, I wanted to share that with you. You know, maybe you're, you've prayed to God for a certain thing. And you get the opposite of what you prayed for. And knowing that very thing grinds against your flesh. And that's what God wants. So, I'm going to end here. Thank you for taking the time to watch and to listen.